the third topic we'd like to talk about today, the third key learning objective is ratio analyses. Uh, what can we do with all of these numbers that we have on our income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow to help us look at the future, to help us detect problems, and to help us determine how we're performing relative to others within our company, within the industry, and across industries? Uh, ratio analysis is very important. You may have had some of this in your managerial accounting course. If you did, it's great. And uh, you're aware of some of this. If not, it's just simple math, mostly division, addition, subtraction, those sorts of things. And it, and it can do some pretty heavy duty analysis here. And we're going to break these uh, ratios into five categories. First category we're going to look at are short term solvency ratios. These are basically liquidity measures. How liquid is the company? We said in the last session that uh, one of the goggles we put on when looking at a balance sheet is liquidity. Um, how fast can we turn assets into cash without loss of value? These, important, uh, these ratios are very important to short-term creditors, and it looks at the company's ability to pay their bills on the, uh, very quickly. Current ratio is very, very important. This is one you must memorize for life. Current assets divided by current liabilities. Both uh, indicators come off of the balance sheet, and a ratio of 2 to 1 is desired. Now, you may see some authors say 1 to 1. I like two to one better because it gives us a little bit of a buffer. I just don't like to be able to uh, just pay my bills. I'd rather have a little bit of a buffer there. So I'm going to recommend a two to one current ratio, uh, whether that be in your personal life or in your business life. Uh, three to one might be even better. We might reach a point where uh, we have too much in the area of current assets where we could better um, invest our cash. But for right now, let's look at two to one. Another second important ratio you want to memorize for life, especially if your company has a lot of inventory, is a quick ratio. Um, we want to subtract out the inventory because it's not very liquid. So we take our current assets minus the inventory amount off the balance sheet and divide by current liabilities. And here we'll get our quick ratio. Um, again, both of the, all of these items for this ratio come off the balance sheet. Uh, cash ratio, less used, but certainly in some companies very, very important. I take uh, cash to current liabilities, it looks at our ability to pay our bills. Do we have enough cash to pay our uh, short-term liabilities in rapid fashion? And uh, all of these numbers come right off the balance sheet. Networking capital to total assets. Last session we said networking capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And uh, we divide this by total assets. And uh, we, we look at, uh, in this ratio, uh, what percentage of our total assets are tied up in networking capital. All of this information comes from the balance sheet. Uh, the interval measure is an interesting, um, somewhat scary ratio. It uh, looks at how long the business can keep running, usually not a good sign. Um, it's current assets divided by average daily operating cost. Current assets we find on the balance sheet, average daily operating cost we find on the income statement by taking total operating cost divided by 365. Uh, again, if you're looking at this ratio, you're probably looking at how long your company can survive. Again, not a good measure, uh, and probably I'd have my resume uh, getting ready if I was asked to calculate this ratio. Uh, the ones we want to uh, emphasize in this group, uh, short-term solvency, are current ratio and quick ratio in terms of memorizing. Uh, second group of the five we're going to go over in ratios, long-term solvency ratios. These measure um, how well, a company can meet their long-term liabilities and their long-term obligations. Uh, basically, a measure of financial leverage. Um, leverage ratios, debt, we said leverage means debt. So how, can we, how are we uh, paying off our debts? Essentially, these ratios we'll look at. Um, total debt ratio, total debt to assets. Uh, so what is total debt? Total assets minus total equity will give us our total debt or total liabilities of all sorts. And again, we find this on the balance sheet. Total debt is under the liabilities category. That's current plus long-term liabilities. And we divide that by our total assets. Um, and we might, again, call that debt-to-assets ratio. Another uh, very important long-term solvency, debt-to-equity. What percentage of our equity is our debt? How leveraged are we? And again, here we're looking at total debts. This is total debt to total equity. Again, both found on the balance sheet. And uh, the third, and these three all tied together. So if you have one of these three first, uh, th first three long-term solvency ratios, you have the other two also just by subtraction and by some simple mathematics. Uh, the third important uh, long-term solvency ratio is uh, equity multiplier. This is total assets over total equity. For some reason, I have difficulty memorizing that because it's not this to that. Uh, like debt to equity, uh, it's a little bit hard. We might call this one assets to equity ratio. 
Um, so the way I break this down, do a little mathematics and, and moving things around, and we get one plus debt to equity ratio. But that's because assets are equal to equity plus debt, and divide that by equity, and we get one plus debt to equity ratio. Um, again, if you memorize any one of these three, uh, you have the other two. So it's important to learn one of these three and then be able to calculate the other two of these very important long-term solvency ratios. The equity multiplier we're going to use again when we come to the uh, DuPont identity a little bit later in this session, so remember that one. And here's that proof I was uh, telling you about again that the equity uh, multiplier or uh, assets to equity ratio is equal to one plus debt to equity ratio. So it's equity over equity plus debt over equity is one plus debt over equity. Same thing as assets to equity. Um, some other long-term solvency ratios, again, secondary, not used quite as much, is the long-term debt to total capitalization. And in fact, in four different industries, I've never seen this one used heavily. More heavily used is long-term debt to equity. So a lot of financial analysts uh, in investment banks and in industry both like to use the long-term debt-to-equity ratio, which is very, very popular. I, I probably put that number one in terms of interest in the long-term solvency ratio category. Um, Harold Janine at ITT ran ITT for a long, long time. He said that in his book, Managing, if I was able to keep my long-term debt-to-equity ratio at 33 and a third percent, I could get any sort of uh, uh, capital on Wall Street at any time. In other words, if I needed to float some more stock or I needed to sell some bonds, I could go knocking on Wall Street's doors and they come uh, running right to me and um, offer me additional debt within reason, of course, and additional equity if I kept and managed my long-term debt to equity ratio around 33 and a third percent. So there's one benchmark um, that you may hear for that ratio. Uh, times interest earned is another long-term solvency ratio, how well a company has their interest expense obligations covered. I find it's EBIT, uh, earnings before interest and taxes, divided by interest expense. Both of these come from the income statement. So basically, do I have enough EBIT to cover my interest expense, and will I uh, profit before tax? Will profit before tax be positive, essentially? So uh, here's it's kind of a coverage ratio once again. Uh, here's another coverage ratio, cash coverage. Uh, EBIT uh, plus depreciation divided by interest expense. So here I'm going to add back depreciation because as we learned in session two, uh, depreciation is a non-cash expense. So no cash is deducted when I deduct that depreciation expense on my income statement. Um, again, are these used heavily? Uh, not as heavily as, uh, say, the first three, and also that long-term uh, long term debt to equity ratio, which is very, very important. So in terms of memorization, memorize long-term debt to equity plus one of the first three, like the total debt to equity equation under long-term solvency ratios. Category number three, asset management ratios. How effectively are we using our assets to do things, to do good things in the company, to turn sales, for instance? Um, we might call these asset utilization ratios. So in category three, we're going to talk about inventory management and accounts receivable management. First of all, inventory turnover ratio. How quickly am I turning my inventory over? Uh, very, very important in, um, let's say, the milk business, for instance. You want to turn that milk over quickly, within the day, hopefully. You don't want the inventory hanging around on the shelves for days and days and weeks and weeks, which will cause spoilage. Um, and we're going to look for mnemonics here again. Are there easy ways to remember these without memorizing them? And we'll show you one uh, here in a minute. Uh, inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. Uh, how many times, again, do I turn over that inventory? The faster, the better. Uh, and then from that, I can calculate my day sales and inventory. Uh, do I have uh, two weeks of inventory? Uh, two weeks of sales and inventory sitting around uh, in the milk business, not good. If it's, for instance, a large equipment manufacturer like Caterpillar, not as bad, not as important to turn it over daily. Uh, perhaps we can sell uh, 12 of those big Caterpillar units in a year do very, very well. So turnover is obviously industry uh, dependent, but certainly we want to turn things faster if possible. To do inventory turnover, I take 365 days. I'm sorry, to do day sales and inventory, I take 365 days divided by inventory turnover, and I get DSI. Um, and again, there's that comparison. Very, very important to turn over uh, that milk very, very quickly. Caterpillar, large equipment, not as important to turn it over daily. Uh, receivables turnover is sales over accounts receivable. Here we'll start to see a pattern starting to form in some of these uh, turnover ratios. 
uh, and I'll give you anything turnover here in a minute. Receivables turnover, sales over accounts receivable. And if I want to do uh, day sales in, in uh, day sales outstanding, 365 days divided by receivable turnover. Um, they also call this average collection period. Our author calls it day sales and receivables. I'm going to give you the more popular term, and that is uh, day sales outstanding is the one you will see when you go to work. So I take 365 days divided by receivables turnover and come up with day sales outstanding. Again, a very, very important uh, ratio in just about every business. Uh, the inventory turnover ratio is more important in companies with inventory. Obviously, if you don't have a lot of inventory, it's not that critical. Uh, some other turnover ratios and start to look for patterns here. Do you see a pattern in these next three ratios? Networking capital turnover is sales over networking capital. How much uh, work do we get out of our working capital? Or how, many, how much sales do we get for every dollar of working capital? Uh, fixed asset turnover ratio is uh, total sales over uh, net fixed assets, and we'll call that net fixed asset turnover ratio. And uh, total asset turnover ratio, sales over total assets. So if you look at the last three ratios, you see that anything turnover is just sales over anything, uh, with one exception, and that exception is uh, inventory turnover, which is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. So again, to memorize these turnover ratios, you want to just do sales over anything, remembering that there's one exception and that is inventory turnover, cost of goods sold, divided by inventory. Uh, next category, category number four, profitability ratios. Very, very important. There are three of these, and the focus on these ratios is net income or profitability. How efficiently are we using is our assets to manage our operations and to generate profit, basically? Uh, first one is profit margin, um, is what the author calls it. I like to call it net return on sales. Again, I want to look for a mnemonic to remember these ratios versus memorize them. So look for a pattern here in the next three ratios. Uh, I take net income divided by sales. Net income off the income statement, sales off the income statement. How many dollars of net income are left for every dollar of sales? Or how many cents of net income for every dollar of sales? Um, again, it's looking at our operating efficiency here. How, how well are we turning uh, sales into net income? So that's uh, equation number one under profitability ratios. Second, net return on assets. How effectively are we turning our assets, uh, using our assets to generate net income? Uh, how many cents of net income per dollar of assets? Net return on assets. And finally, uh, net return on equity, very, very important uh, ratio for investors. How, how much uh, net income is generated by the equity in the business? Uh, NROE, we may call this. So if we look at the last three ratios, profitability ratios, we see a pattern or a mnemonic forming. Uh, net return on anything is net income divided by anything. Okay, and uh, which ones do we want to remember for life? All three of these. So if we remember the mnemonic, we remember all three equations all at once. The fifth category of ratios are market value ratios. These are very, very important uh, to analysts, to outsiders, uh, to companies that are in, might be interested in buying your company. Um, and where do we find these income statement, balance sheet, or elsewhere? Where do we find the components is important to know. Uh, to calculate these ratios. First, price earnings ratio. How much are investors willing to pay for your company um, per dollar of earnings? So price per share found out in the markets. We might find this in uh, Yahoo Finance, uh, Google Finance, any, anywhere out there online. Uh, I can find the price per share uh, up to the minute uh, divided by earnings per share. Uh, PE ratio is used heavily. Uh, how do I calculate that earnings per share, though? I found the price per share. Uh, sometimes even in, in our uh, local newspapers, you see some uh, stock price listings and also online everywhere on your phones, uh, on your computers, netbooks, laptops, and so on. You can look these up in an instant. But how do you find earnings per share? Well, it's earnings, net income. We said earnings. Another word for net income is earnings. Net income divided by number of shares outstanding. Net income comes from the income statement, shares outstanding from the balance sheet. So that will give us our earnings per share, and we use that in the denominator of the P-E ratio. Market to book ratio, uh, what is the price per share divided by the book value per share? Uh, historically averaged about 1.7 to 1 uh, market to book um, across the 30 largest uh, U.S. companies. 
Uh, now it's, and sometimes it'll be even double that much, but uh, historically it's been about 1.7 to 1. Market value per share divided by book value per share. It's price per share divided by book value. Again, book value uh, is translated as assets minus liabilities. That's shareholders' equity. Uh, we said owner's equity. We call it net worth. We also call it book value. And then I'm going to divide both of those by, I'm going to divide that by the number of shares outstanding to get market to book. Those are the five key categories, uh, and I've pointed out the ones you should remember. In the, in the uh, market value ratios, you should remember all of those. Those are used heavily every day by analysts and by uh, those in industry and on Wall Street.